Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to try and talk today about what blockchain is useful for. Uh, I'm sure this conference has had a lot of conversation about cryptocurrencies, digital assets, financial innovation. But I'd like to take a little step back and try and sort of think about what the philosophical underpinnings of blockchain is for. Uh, then I'm going to look at sort of what kind of things we have so far and what's good and you know, not necessarily what's bad. Then I'm going to look at the current approaches to sort of complex cooperation, what we're working on, and where we think the greatest impact is. So cooperation is the means by which humanity has advanced. Almost every civilization and culture can be defined by the manner in which it cooperates. However, cooperation has a lot of risk involved. Cooperation between two or three people is quite easy. You can infer intentions of your partners. You can figure out whether they're trustworthy. And you can define suitable penalties for non-performance. As you expand that set of people, cooperation gets more and more complex. Hence, we have a curve here that has a positive relationship between risk and cooperation. In order to deal with that trade-off throughout history, we've generally created forms of centralization. Each civilization or culture creates a set of tools by which it manages these risks, and it usually incorporates some form of centralization. For any given structure, we would say that excessive centralization leads to a breakdown in cooperation, because people simply stop obeying the rules. In the same structure, excessive to a chaotic system and far too much risk. And again, people stop cooperating. So whilst centralization has been extremely useful, it comes with some major externalities. Galileo was imprisoned for saying that the Earth revolves around the sun. The USSR had no meaningful ways to figure out how many bath plugs to make. And more recently, we had a small selection of banks who contributed greatly to the financial crisis. So what we want to do is create a safer way to cooperate, such that we can have more cooperation and more decentralization, thus getting rid of the externalities or reducing the externalities of centralization. And we have past form in this. Democracy is democracy and the Enlightenment and the tools that they developed, such as freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, democratic participation, equality before the law, are all components of a consensus algorithm. In the internet and distributed systems and networks, we've created a new domain. It's extremely large, complex, international. And the systems we've developed so far to manage our interactions on that substrate, they have limited meaning. There are new risks, and we don't have ways to deal with it. So what we're trying to do in blockchain and distributed consensus is to try and shift the curve up and to the right in the same manner that democracy has done. Because currently, our interactions on this new domain are mediated by a small group of very large companies. And for good reason, it's immensely complex. But to give you an example, when you go to visit a website, you will often be asked to log in via either Google or Facebook. This is really just an example of very large companies taking on the role of government. Now, that in itself isn't necessarily the worst thing. But over time, we feel it will create negative externalities. And I think in watching these very large companies absorb smaller companies all of the time, that we are reducing the possibility for additional innovation and development. So let's think about what, so let's think about what each system of cooperation creates in the first instance, almost always a unit of account. And this is why we've been talking about cryptocurrencies quite a lot. Now, it is the, a unit of accounts of gold, silver, seashells, or Bitcoin. Uh, they're very useful mechanisms by which to store the value of our work, and they reduce complexity for additional cooperation. The structure of each medium of account essentially underpins 
how the rest of the system will operate. If you have excess inflation, the system breaks down. So we would argue that in the current environment, the mechanisms by which units, account, units of accounts, payments, and money are transferred are pretty fit for purpose. On the XRP ledger today, you can transfer minute or vast amounts of value in seconds at a fraction of a penny using Interledger, which is uh, essentially a decentralized form of FX, a, a decentralized system will come together to convert, root, and packetize your money to get to the right place at almost no risk. And if you don't want to be the product of large tech corporations, you can now buy content directly using micropayments from the creators. So we think that that system is pretty fit for purpose. It's cheap, it's inexpensive, it's scalable. However, money and payments are not excessively complex. So we want to create systems that allow for much more complex cooperation. As the number of parties increases, you have many more outcomes, many more variables, and the risks increase. So this graph is the mirror image of the graph on, on slide one. As cooperation increases, safety reduces. So there are a couple of things, there are lots of risks in our industry, but there are a couple of things we're trying to deal with in general. The first is uh, Byzantine fault tolerance. This is how to achieve consensus in the presence of a limited number of malicious actors. The second is Sybil resistant, where in an open system, one participant may be operating multiple computers. So the problem we're trying to tackle is how to create a safe substrate for cooperation with high performance. And that's quite a complex thing to try to do. So the existing systems that do it, and I'm just going to cover proof of work and proof of stake. Proof of stake is the algorithm that's sort of popular at the moment. They both use money to secure the system. Proof of work makes it essentially extremely expensive to take control of the system and write what you want into the ledger. Proof of stake means that you have to put up money to enter the system, and there are financial penalties for being a malicious actor. Both have their own centralization problems. Proof of work has a hardware centralization problem where there's very few people in the world that actually control the hardware that allow it to be operated. And proof of stake has the issue of how do you determine what is malicious behavior? How do you determine the appropriate sanction? But both of them, I think, have a slightly more, well, larger problem, which is if you just secure a network with money, that is incredibly inefficient. So let's just take the example of trying to build a business of the scale of Facebook, which is worth roughly half a trillion dollars, on a network that is underpinned only by money for its security. So let's say you have a network like you know, some, of the, some of those that are out there, one worth four billion. How do you secure 500 billion worth of value with a network secured by 4 billion? Because suddenly, all of the incentives to be a good actor break down. And so we think that essentially what is currently existing is unscalable. And taken to its logical conclusion would be a massively inefficient use of capital and deeply regressive, especially given we actually have better ways to deal with it already in the existing world. And it's called law and sanction. So this brings us on to a structure of a network that has a more proactive way of dealing with security. Federated Byzantine agreements used by Ripple and Stellar. Developed, uh, the, the main paper of it written by David Maziers, the chief scientist of Stellar. Uh, each participant in the network makes its own security decisions. They decide which other participant they want to trust. The collection of these decisions defines the network. And this makes it extremely hard for attackers to come into the system because they can come in and they can extend their trust lines into the network, but the network does not reciprocally trust them. So in order for their, the attackers to get trusted, they have to essentially persist on the network and be good and then eventually get trusted. And for a, you know, a reasonably sizable network, for enough people to do that, that's extremely hard. Plus, when they are shown to be malicious, 
uh, the network can immediately move away from them and drop them in their trust sets. So it's, it's a much more proactive way of handling how we do consensus on a distributed system. The one issue is that the existing implementations do not currently support smart contracts, which means that they don't really give a mechanism by which we can cooperate in a more complex manner. So this brings us to the Flare network. Flare is the first Turing complete federated Byzantine agreement protocol, meaning that it supports smart contracts. It's fair, asynchronous, and leaderless. And we think it provides a really safe, fair, useful, and hopefully scalable substrate for interoperability. Our first implementation will be a smart contract network that is powered by Interledger. We won't be launching a uh, token immediately. We will be creating a smart contract network that you can essentially come to and pay for your computation in any arbitrary crypto. So that's quite a fun and interesting approach. Now, lastly, I just want to deal with where I think personally, this is a personal view, of where you can maximize the impact of what blockchain is doing. Most of the people you know, in our industry are looking at finance in the West, doing these kind of things which frankly already have relatively high levels of protection, are relatively, relatively competitive and function quite well. It's not to say that what people are proposing isn't a great idea, they may well be, but we just think there's other areas that will probably benefit from blockchain first. And to give you a good example, you know, we try to look for places, industries where there are very high power concentrations. So there's over a billion farmers in the world, probably many more. And however, there's not that many commodity companies that buy farm products. You've got Cargill, Tyson, you know, there's a few very, very large companies. And what that means is that you have essentially a vast amount of people who individually gen don't generate that much value, but collectively they generate a vast amount of value. And however, they are all individually, they don't have much pricing power against very large incumbent corporates. So we think that, you know, where cooperation could be extremely useful is in redressing that balance and essentially allowing these people to form what many people would call cooperatives. However, cooperatives suffer massively from, from centralization issues, uh, but essentially a substrate for them to cooperate in a voluntary manner. And that's really what we think blockchain is useful for. So thank you very much, and I really look forward to your questions.